talk today about problem behavior and uh, uh, different methods that we use to assess, uh, to evaluate problem behavior, and how those assessment methods help us develop better intervention for, particularly for in, uh, people with uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities, uh, although this methodology has some generality to it, so, so it has the potential to be used with other clinical populations. So let me give you a general overview of uh, functional analysis methodology because this is the, the method that is going to be used in the set of studies that I want to share with you uh, today. Uh, well, first of all, it's an experimental approach, uh, meaning that we manipulate certain things and we observe changes in behavior over time. Uh, and uh, in, in spite of the fact that it's experimental, which sounds very academic, uh, it's a methodology that is adapted to be used into, in a clinical setting. So what kinds of things do we manipulate during a functional analysis? We uh, look at things like uh, what happens before the behavior and what happens after. Uh, for instance, a problem behavior may be uh, related with uh, teachers or caregivers presenting demands or uh, providing attention after the problem behavior has occurred. So we look at these uh, naturally occurring events in a systematic manner uh, in the at, in, with the attempt to observe what might be causing the behavior. I want to show you that, uh, I'll show you that in, in a video in a, in a minute. So we have uh, several conditions that we present several over a number of times during a functional analysis. And uh, if in any of these particular conditions we see that responding is the highest or higher, uh, we take that as evidence that the conditions that we manipulated in the particular uh, arrangement may be causing uh, the problem behavior. So a functional analysis uh, is typically graphed in, uh, in the way shown in the slide, where you have a uh, level of uh, responses uh, over the y-axis and time, usually in the form of sessions along the x-axis. So for instance, in the first graph on the top, we see that there is higher uh, behavior in the condition called attention. It's a condition in which every time that the behavior occurs, uh, the caregiver or the experimenter is presenting uh, attention following the occurrence of the problem behavior. And uh, if we see this pattern over time, then we take that as evidence that that behavior might be maintained by access to social attention. But let's see how uh, uh, an attention condition looks like in, in this short video. Okay, so what do we see there? First of all, the, the experimenter or the car giver uh, is ignoring the client. That's the antecedent to this condition. Uh, as soon as the behavior occurs, even a low magnitude instance of the behavior, as you saw in the first case when the, when the, uh, when the client was slightly touching the, the wall, the, uh, the experimenter present attention, usually in the form of some kind of verbal and physical comfort. And that arrangement continues over the duration of the session and we repeat a number of sessions over time. And if we see that during this particular condition, the behavior is high, we assume that the behavior is maintained by attention. Another uh, condition that is being known to maintain uh, problem behavior uh, we call it demand in a typical functional analysis. And in the demand condition, the uh, experimenter or the caregiver is presenting tasks or requests to engage in different uh, school-like or academic activities. 
and uh, uh, as soon as the behavior occurs, the uh, card giver is going to give a small break, uh, usually 30 seconds, 15 seconds uh, break. If we see that during this condition, the behavior increases, again, we make the same inference. Uh, we assume that the behavior is maintained by uh, escape from task demands. Let's take a look at how this uh, condition looks like. That uh, session could well be part of an assessment like this, where uh, presentation of demands is a common antecedent to the presentation of problem behavior, in this case, a form of self-injurious behavior, in this particular case, uh, head hidden. Uh, and as you saw, the, uh, the car giver or the experimenter is providing a break right after the problem behavior occurs. And we, uh, in this type of situation, we assume that that uh, type of event, escape from task demand, is task demands is the is what is maintaining, we would say, reinforcing uh, the behavior. There is a last uh, test condition in a functional analysis, which is uh, the most relevant to the talk today. I'm going to be talking about mostly about behaviors that are maintained by what we call automatic reinforcement. Uh, and that simply means that the behavior is maintained by its own sensory uh, products. Uh, every time that we engage in a behavior, uh, there are some sensory byproducts that go with it. And uh, in many cases, that's enough to maintain the behavior. So let's see um, how these behaviors look like. In the case of behaviors maintained by automatic reinforcement or by sensory feedback, if you, if you will, um, there is a good correlation between the form of the behavior and the factor that is maintaining the behavior. Uh, and the, the examples that you saw before, mm, we really don't know, based on the form of the behavior, what might be maintaining it. So for instance, self-injurious behavior may, may be maintained by access to attention, may be maintained by escape, may be maintained by sensory feedback. Uh, however, there are specific forms of behavior that are known to be maintained by sensory feedback or automatic reinforcement in a very high uh, percentage. So I'm going to show you just a few examples of those in, in these videos. So uh, you have examples of, of motor uh, and complex stereotypies, like in the form of locomotion, uh, complex stereotypy with uh, vocal and motor components. Uh, another example there, nose rubbing, self-hugging, spinning, and also uh, problem behavior in the form of sustaining uh, postures for long periods of time. So these are typical examples of behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement. Uh, how do we assess these particular uh, types of behaviors? Uh, given that the, uh, the behavior are maintained by its own consequences, the, the consequences that the organism itself is delivering, uh, the, the alone condition, which is the condition that is used to test uh, behaviors maintained by automatic reinforcement is, is simply uh, you know, a, a very barren environment where no stimuli is presented. We simply observe the client for five, 10 minutes at a time, and we see how often the behavior occurs. It often happens that these behaviors occur at a very high frequency, as you see in, 
and the example of this client in the video. Uh, the problem behavior was uh, rubbing the, forcefully the back of his neck. This case was a, a problem severe enough to, to cause uh, severe injuries. Okay, so I've given you a, a general overview of uh, functional analysis. I'm going to assume now that you all know what it is because I'm going to be referring to it throughout the presentation. But why we do this? Why take the time to assess uh, problem behavior in this manner? Well, there are many reasons, but uh, uh, this slide here can, uh, can uh, provide an answer to that. And the answer is that uh, the interventions that we can develop if we know what is the functional cause of the behavior, are way more effective. These are some preliminary findings from a meta-analysis that we have, in, uh, we have currently in preparation. And in this uh, particular study, we combined all the uh, uh, empirical evaluations of interventions that were based in a functional analysis and interventions that were not based in a functional analysis. And we compared their effectiveness. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the graph, but essentially you can see that when the function-based intervention is compared to baseline, or no intervention, we have an effect size of uh, around one, which is an effect size compatible with a significant clinical effect. Uh, the, sim the same finding when we compare a function-based versus a non-function-based uh, intervention, so uh, essentially the non-function-based intervention or interventions that are not grounded in a functional analysis are as effective as nothing, which was something that surprised us. Um, here you can see the same. Uh, when no intervention is compared to a non-function-based intervention, uh, there were mm, uh, essentially no effect, zero effect size. So that's the main reason of uh, engaging in uh, this type of assessment before uh, an intervention is developed. You can see here the, the same in more detail. So, what are some common limitations of functional analysis methodology? And, uh, and of course there are many, but yet I'm just going to mention three because are the three ones that prompted the three studies that I want to share with you today. So, uh, first, the uh, patterns of, uh, of uh, functional analysis results that are compatible with an automatic function. Remember, automatic means behavior maintained by sensory feedback are very diverse and uh, we don't really know how many of these patterns are there and we don't know how those different patterns might or might not be related with the effect of different treatments. So that's what we tried to look at in the first, uh, in the first uh, study that I'll present today. Uh, this, the second study is uh, 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 what we call an experimental analysis of an intervention. A uh, common intervention for behaviors maintained by sensory feedback is to try to identify uh, activities or stimuli that produce a similar sensory input in an attempt to try to replace that behavior with more adaptive uh, activities or exposure to, to more you know, acceptable stimuli. Uh, so that's what we call a match stimuli uh, presentation. And that intervention uh, is not very clear wh why it works. There are different hypotheses in terms of what mechanisms may be driving its effect. So in this study, we, we try to look a little deeper into this intervention, try to understand what may be driving its effects. And the last, uh, in the last study, we, want to, we looked at how uh, exposure to different psychotropic medications may alter behavior function. So if you remember the graph before, we identified uh, attention or uh, uh, access to social attention, escape from task demands, and uh, exposure to the sensory products of the behavior as maintaining factors for problem behavior. Uh, uh, we don't know if those functions of the behavior may be changed or altered uh, by the fact that the client may be put into a particular medication, which is the case uh, probably in about half of, of the clients that, uh, that received uh, behavioral intervention. So it's, it's important to know uh, about that in order to interact more effectively with other professionals that might be serving uh, 
a particular client. So we, we look into that in some detail in that uh, third study. Okay, let's start with the first study. Patterns of functional analysis that are compatible with an automatic uh, function or sensory feedback uh, function that I described before. This is the graph or a similar graph to the one I presented you before. Uh, you see that the alone condition, the condition when the, where the client is left alone with no presentation of activities, we see that the behavior is higher in that condition. And we take that as evidence that the behavior is maintained by automatic or by sensory feedback. This is what we call the typical pattern. There's another pattern accepted in the literature, which is the undifferentiated pattern, which is also considered as evidence or compatible with an automatic function. What is happening here? Uh, well, the assumption that uh, we typically made is that the uh, sensory feedback that the behavior produced is so strong that no matter what you do in the other conditions, it's not strong enough to interfere at any level with the behavior. That's why you see a lot of behavior happening throughout all conditions. So that's why we take uh, both patterns as evidence of uh, behavior maintained by, by automatic. The questions that we wanted to answer in this study is, are there other patterns? And if they are, do they give us any information about treatment effectiveness? So we look, uh, we look, uh, look up some uh, literature and also went back to some, uh, some functional analysis that we did. And we, we thought that we identify at least three additional patterns. So this would be an additional pattern. Here you see that uh, behavior occurs in most conditions. Still the alone condition is the highest. But for some reason, uh, uh, during the alone condition, you see uh, very little behavior. S something similar happened, and we call that condition, uh, attention condition low. Uh, sorry, that pattern. Uh, we found another pattern in which we uh, see something very similar to the undifferentiated pattern, but uh, responding during demand is also very, very low. So we thought that that might be an additional pattern, and we call it demand condition low. And Finally, in the play condition low, we see, again, behavior occurring throughout the conditions of a functional analysis, but during play, we see very little behavior. These patterns are interesting because they are identifying a situation in which the behavior is low. So that might be relevant in order to maybe capture some of the components of that intervention and translate them into treatment. So, sorry. So what might be happening in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this additional patterns? Well, we thought that maybe in this, in this uh, attention condition low pattern, uh, the presentation of social attention following the problem behavior, which is what happens in the, in the attention condition, may be discouraging uh, uh, the behavior, or maybe what we would say in technical terms, punishing the behavior. So if a particular client has this uh, type of pattern, maybe presenting the right uh, uh, verbal redirection after the behavior occurs may be uh, an, uh, an important treatment component for the client. In the demand condition low, uh, there are a number of things that could be happening because it's the condition of the functional analysis where more, the most manipulations are being made. So for instance, uh, during the demand condition, the client receives praise every time that it engages in the demand that is being requested of him or her. So uh, that could be something that interferes with engaging in the problem behavior. So that could be uh, a mechanism that could be acting there. Also, the presentation of tasks and the presentation of attention, the mere presence of the caregiver, may be also interfering with the behavior, explaining this low responding here. Finally, the, uh, the withdrawal of attention uh, uh, during the escape, during the break uh, intervals, during the demand conditions, also could be uh, reducing the behavior through negative punishment. But you know, don't, uh, don't uh, bother about the jargon too much. Essentially, there are different mechanisms that may be explaining why in a particular client the demand condition might be low. 
finally, during the play condition low, the, we could have two things happening. Either the presentation of preferred leisure items, toys, which is a component of the, of the uh, play condition, uh, maybe reducing the behavior, or the non-contingent presentation of attention. And that simply means the presentation in regular periods of social attention, which is a component of the play condition. Sorry, I didn't mention this before, but the play condition is considered the control condition of a functional analysis. We always expect that behavior is slow during, uh, during the play condition, because if, uh, if the behavior is maintained by attention, and you present attention in regular intervals, doesn't matter if the client engages in the behavior or not, uh, we might see less behavior because the client does not need to engage in the behavior to, uh, to obtain attention. On the other hand, no demands are presented. So if the behavior is maintained by escape from demands, we won't see uh, the behavior in the play condition. Finally, if the behavior is maintained by automatic, by sensory feedback, and we present prefer leisure activities and items, those activities might interfere with behavior maintained by, by sensory yeah. feedback. So uh, we just hypothesized those three patterns. Then we looked at the uh, literature and we tried to identify those patterns. So this is just a, a short review that includes 37 cases, th 37 published cases. We are uh, currently in the process of expanding this uh, reviewed several hundreds of, of cases, but just reviewing 37 cases, uh, we found, uh, we were able to identify all these patterns. Uh, this graph is simply a summary of the, of the functional analysis graph. So we simply averaged ev uh, responding in every condition. So for instance, attention condition low, you see that uh, attention is lower, demand condition low, demand is lower, play condition low, uh, play condition, responding during play condition is lower. Uh, we found that these additional conditions actually account for about 35-40% uh, of, of cases. So we thought it might be an interesting, uh, you know, uh, topic of research to pursue. We later uh, conducted uh, a bunch of functional analysis of our, of our own under steady assessment conditions. And again, we were able to identify these three patterns, uh, these three additional patterns. In this case, uh, they accounted for over 50% of the, of the cases that we evaluated. So the next, uh, the next question is to determine if these patterns actually give us any useful information in terms of treatment. So what we uh, set ourselves to do was to identify these various patterns in different clients and determine first uh, if delivering that component uh, that seemed to reduce the behavior many times actually was a potential form of treatment. And second, we conducted a component analysis, meaning that we look at the different elements that are in the, in the condition that produce low behavior to determine which particular element was was driving the reduction of problem behavior. So in this, uh, this assessment, assessment here, uh, what, uh, anybody knows what pattern might this one be? Play condition low, demand condition low, attention condition low? Play low. So we thought this might be a case of play condition low, so we included this participant uh, in the study. So remember, here we have two components that we can look at. One is preferred items, and second is non-contingent or uh, presentation of attention at regular intervals. So this is the analysis that we, uh, we conducted here. And uh, so uh, you see that when we present play over a number of sessions in a different experimental design uh, relative to the functional analysis, we still see low levels of behavior. And the second thing was to break down the two components of the play condition and to see which of the two were driving the, suppressive, the suppression of problem behavior. Here uh, we see that uh, the presentation of highly preferred edible items uh, 
uh, seem to be the factor that actually reduces the behavior because when we eliminated those preferred items and continue presenting uh, attention at regular intervals, the second component of the play condition, the problem behavior continued to be high. So in this particular client, that seemed to be uh, the, the, the presentation of preferred items seemed to be driving the reductive effects of, of, um, uh, uh, that we observe in the play condition during the functional analysis. So uh, that's an important piece of information that could be factoring in the development of treatment. In this uh, second client, uh, what pattern do you think this might be? Demand condition low, play condition low, attention condition low. This was a case of demand condition low, uh, probably not as clear, but uh, we thought it, 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 would, it could work. So we move on to the component analysis. In this case, the component analysis is a little more complicated because, as I said before, there are more things happening in the, in the demand condition. But we found something interesting. And uh, when we present the condition as in the functional analysis, we see that the behavior goes down. So the pattern identifying the functional analysis was confirmed. And then we started removing elements from the condition. So we first eliminated the praise that is delivered following uh, compliance. And we still saw uh, very low levels of behavior. We then uh, remove the escape component, the breaks that uh, the participant is provided with every time that he or she engages in problem behavior. And again, the behavior continued to be low. Then we removed all other components, uh, all the prompts, verbal and model prompts, that uh, physical prompts that are presented throughout the session and we still saw low levels of behavior. So finally, the only element that was less, left was the, the task presentation. And, uh, and in, uh, when we just presented the task, the behavior continued to be low. And we, that finding was replicated here in the reversal. So in this case, we concluded that it's simply the presentation of, a, of the task that was enough to suppress the behavior in this particular case uh, or in this particular client. So some summaries, uh, some, some conclusions to this, uh, to this study. First, the functional, functional analysis compatible with an automatic function uh, can be classified in at least five patterns and not just the two that are generally accepted in the literature. Uh, some of these patterns may predict uh, differential effectiveness of particular interventions. And third, a, spe a specific functional analysis, co analysis condition components may be responsible for suppressing the behavior in particular clients, and uh, which component works for a particular client might be uh, idiosyncratic, although we, we would need more assessments as the one I just presented to, to make uh, you know, more solid uh, conclusions. So in summary, the interpretation of multiple patterns uh, of functional analysis compatible with an automatic or uh, sensory feedback function may enhance uh, clinical decision making and treatment design. Okay, any questions about this study? <laughs> I'll move on to uh, the second study that I wanted to share with you today. And uh, th in this study, we are again looking into behaviors that are maintained by sensory feedback. But we are taking one of the treatments that are accepted in the literature and we are sort of taking a deeper look into it and trying to determine what might be driving the effects of that treatment in an attempt to optimize intervention. So the treatment in question is uh, match stimulation, is an intervention in which we identify leisure items, songs, activities, that might be producing the same type of sensory feedback uh, as the behavior produces. So for example, if the behavior is uh, self-rubbing, for example, we can provide access to uh, certain toys that produce certain, uh, certain uh, tact tactile sti stimulation that we assume or, or we presume are similar uh, 
to the stimulation or the stimuli that the engaging in the behavior is producing. Now, when we do that, uh, we see that the behavior goes down. But we don't know exactly why the behavior goes down. Is it because it is replacing the sensory stimuli, or is it because it is interfering with the sensory stimuli? We don't know. So we thought that there might be a way to differentiate those various mechanisms. And the slide here uh, shows you how that uh, could work. So when we present much uh, stimulation, we see that the behavior goes down. There's no behavior. And when we removed the match stimulation, the behavior, of course, is going to go back as it was during baseline. Uh, but the process or the period of transition towards baseline levels can tell us information about what was that stimuli or those stimuli doing during the intervention. So, for example, if we see this pattern here that we call a bouncing pose effect, uh, what might be happening is that uh, the, uh, the, behave, the, the match stimuli was impeding to access the, uh, the sensory products of the behavior. So, uh, following the example I just presented, if the behavior is self-probing and, uh, and you provide access to, uh, for instance, uh, a rubber ball, that produce a similar uh, feeling to it than rubbing yourself. And we see this pattern here, but we see a, a bouncing effect after the intervention has been withdrawn. We, uh, we cannot assume that the, uh, the sensory feedback was equivalent. Uh, anybody can think of why? The, uh, when, you are, uh, when you don't have access for some time to something that is reinforcing to you, something that you like, what's going to happen when you all of a sudden have access to it? You're going to get really excited. Yeah. You want to do it more. Do it more. Do it more at least temporarily. Okay? So that's what we assume is happening here. Uh, this is compatible with what we technically call a deprivation effect, uh, in which during some time the client has not had access to that sensory feedback. So when the sensory feedback is available again, you're going to engage in the behavior temporarily more often until you get back down to baseline levels. Some question over there? Question then. So what? What's the, the period of time between where that dotted line is then? Is that consistent all the way through? Yeah, that's, that's the next slide. I want to talk about that in the next slide because that's an important element in this type of reason. The time is a, is a big factor. So if we see this pattern, that might be compatible with a deprivation effect, and that means that the match stimuli is not replacing the sensory feedback. It's simply providing some stimulation that competes with the behavior, but does not replace, uh, does not replace the sensory feedback. On the other hand, if we find a pattern such as this one here, the conclusion is the opposite. The match stimuli is actually providing something very similar to what the behavior might be doing, because when we remove the, uh, uh, the treatment, we don't see that bouncing effect. In other words, the client was not deprived of the sensory stimulation. And then we see a gradual recovery of the behavior. These three, uh, this additional pattern here uh, that we call direct interference is a situation in which the, treatment, the match stimuli is, uh, uh, is interfering with the behavior, but there is no pause effect, or there, there is no either deprivation or satiation effects. And we don't really know if, if this pattern, uh, you know, can happen. You know, we have some clues based on, on the data we've collected so far. Okay, so time. Uh, people that have tried to evaluate these effects in the literature has not, have not been able to consistently identify these patterns. And we thought it might be a matter of time. How close are you looking into time to identify uh, these effects. Uh, 
Typically, you, you look at 10 minute sessions, five minute sessions, and then you, you cannot find these effects. And the reason might be because these processes take place in very short periods of time. And this graph here can give us an idea of what is the time frame that we are talking about. Uh, these graphs uh, show a problem behavior maintained by automatic. Uh, we look at over a thousand occurrences of the behavior over a, in, in a very long period of time in the various, in the various conditions that compose uh, a functional analysis, a long attention play demand. And then uh, we looked at how the probability of the behavior changed after uh, uh, an occurrence of the behavior just happened. So for instance, if time zero is an occurrence of the behavior, we see uh, what's the probability that the behavior occurs again over time. And here you have seconds along the, along the x axis. So interestingly, what we see, and this is just one client, but we've seen this in, in a number of data sets, we see that the, the probability of the behavior to reoccur is the highest just one second, two seconds, three seconds after the behavior has occurred. And then it goes down. Uh, here you have, these are simply reference data. It's the same number of occurrences distributed randomly. Uh, and you see that this is not random. This is really uh, an effect. So what that might mean? Well, uh, it means that the, when a behavior is high frequency, as it is often the case in behavior maintained by sensory feedback, you see the behavior to occur in, li in, in little groupings, in little clusters. And uh, if we uh, assume that that behavior is producing access to sensory stimulation that is rewarding to the client, it might very well be the case that they engage in the behavior until they become temporarily satiated of the behavior. Then they take a break and they do it again later. Uh, and this happens over very short periods of time. So we thought that to to identify these various patterns, we should, have, we should look at a very short period of times after we withdraw the intervention to identify these effects. Are you with me? <laughs> so how do we go about testing this in the field? Uh, so we designed this, inter this study uh, that has four phases to it. Initially, we wanted to run a functional anal analysis, confirm that the function is indeed automatic. Then uh, we have to uh, identify uh, identify a matched stimuli, a stimuli that suppress uh, the behavior, maybe because they produce the same kind of sensory feedback, maybe for other reasons. Then we have to confirm that extended exposure to those items or those activities indeed reduces the behavior for a long period of time. And then when we have finished those three phases, we can go out and test these transition effects between uh, uh, after the withdrawal, withdrawal of the intervention. So you have, we have to go through a long study to actually test what we intended to, intended to evaluate. So this is the functional analysis part. Uh, here you can see that uh, either, they either, we either see the typical pattern with higher responding during alone or the undifferentiated pattern. Uh, again, both patterns are compatible with an automatic function, a behavior maintained by uh, uh, sensory feedback uh, in these three uh, clients. Subsequently, we run the suppression uh, assessment in which we present uh, different items, different activities, clapping, hand, head, rubbing the arm, different types of music, rubbing the neck, another type of music, different types of songs, uh, depending of, of what seemed to be effective uh, based on, on caregiver report for each client. We presented each activity for periods of time and we observe uh, the behavior. And then uh, when we run this, after we run this assessment, we selected the items that were the most uh, suppressive to use during the intervention. So in the third phase, uh, there are different components to, to, to this third phase. I don't, wanna, I don't think it's necessary to get into detail, but essentially for these two clients that were part of this assessment, what you need to see is that when match stimulation was presented for long periods of time, 
you see in the uh, that, uh, match stimulation condition is showed here in the blue uh, data path, you, uh, we saw that the behavior was much lower, was lower, and, and this effect was consistent over a long period of time and was replicated. So we thought that those items uh, were good to, to evaluate the hypothesis that we had in mind. Okay, so now we get into phase number four. So what happened here? <laughs> this is uh, against another bunch of data, but I'm just gonna try to pay attention to the part that, that is the most interesting. We have uh, 30 second beans, so we are looking at what's happening 30 seconds after the, after the intervention has been withdrawn. A minute, 90 seconds, two minutes after the intervention has been withdrawn. We are averaging what's happening across several repetitions of conditions, that's why you have here averages and uh, error, uh, in an attempt to identify these, these effects. Uh, this pattern here in this particular client, Simon, don't pay attention, for, this was done for a methodological reason, we don't need to bother about that. Uh, for this particular client, we see the direct interference pattern. We, we saw no bouncing effect, we saw no gradual recovery. So if this would be the pattern that we observe in our clients, then you know, both of our hypotheses, either the association or the deprivation are wrong. Uh, so that was Simon. George. This was uh, more interesting, of course, because uh, as you can see during the intervention, the behavior was lower relative to the baseline. And right after the intervention was withdrawn, we saw a bouncing uh, effect. So this particular pattern, in the case of George, suggests that the intervention was not replacing the sensory uh, stimuli. And uh, it was consistent with a deprivation uh, effect. Finally, for Helen, we saw the third pattern, gradual recovery to baseline levels. So in a way, these, the, the data sets of these three clients were interesting because the three patterns were confirmed. They all exist in the real world. It's just a matter of us being able to assess them and identify them in our clients. Of course, these are the types of stimuli that we want to identify because if the stimuli or the activities that we have during treatment are actually replacing the sensory, uh, the sensory reinforcer in technical terms, uh, the treatment has a better chance to uh, produce sustainable effects and uh, a more uh, and larger effects. So summary and clinical recommendations. Both association and deprivation effects may be very short term, few seconds. Uh, value of high temporal resolution analysis for assessment of post effects. This study is the first to use this type of, you know, high time resolution analysis to identify these effects. And finally, uh, the presumably much stimuli that replaces the reinforcer would lead to more effective and sustainable uh, treatment gains. Okay, so that was study number two. Can I ask a question about that one? Mm -hmm. So in the bouncing option, um, which is which you call deprivation, um, the the fact is that uh, George in this case really had a choice to make. He could have engaged in, for example, the rubbing behavior that you use as an example, or he could have rubbed the, uh, yes. the ball. He wasn't actually deprived of the ability to rub himself. Yes, 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 yes. He chose, apparently, of to course, of rub course. the ball. So how, how, I mean, deprivation doesn't seem quite the right way to describe what was going on there. Mm -hmm. It's not like he had no access. Yes, to yes, yes. Uh, well... That might be true or might not be true. One thing is engaging in the behavior that typically produces a sensory reinforcer. Another thing is to actually experience the sensory reinforcer after engaging in that behavior. So for instance, if, uh, if I play loud music here and I give you your favorite books, uh, you are probably not very likely to read them 
even though you, you have access to the reading response, because the loud music is interfering with the sensory products of uh, reading behavior. Follow? But then it's not. But, but, but do, do, do that again with an example of match stimuli. Yes, well, I can tell you what happened actually with this client. The, his behavior was self-injury. Okay. And um, we, he engaged in types of self-injury that produce sound. So he would uh, either hit himself, okay. producing a clap sound in his face, or sometimes he would do that, uh, engaging in property destruction. So we thought that uh, uh, sound feedback might be one of the components of, that was maintaining this behavior. So we assessed a number of songs. And I believe the, the, it was a particular type of, of song or music that we played here. Uh, so during all these sessions, music is being played. That had clapping in it? No, uh, it was different types of song. Oh, okay. Wh whatever was the most suppressive in the suppression assessment. Okay. Uh, he had access to engaging in the behavior all throughout the study, of course. Um, what happened here? Well, it might be that the sound, and this is just an interpretation. We, really don't, we cannot get into the head of the client to know. But an interpretation would be that the, the sound that these, you know, these songs uh, involve uh, interfere. Mask. Mask or interfere with the sensory feedback of the behavior itself. So it's, it, reduce, it may be reducing the, the uh, exposure to the sensory reinforcer for that reason, producing a deprivation-like, if you will, mm -hmm. effect. So that's the interpretation that we have. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you for, for uh, I think it was helpful for, for everybody. OK, uh, so the last study that I wanted to share with you today has to do with medication and how it might affect the function of problem behavior. And remember that by function, I mean no other by motivation. What might be motivating problem behavior? We, we've seen that access to attention, escape from uh, unpreferred activities, and access to sensory feedback are the most common uh, uh, factors maintaining these behaviors. Uh, if you look at the literature that compares uh, unimodal versus combined interventions, interventions that use uh, behavioral or even a psychotherapeutic uh, approach, and we, you compare their effectiveness when they are combined with a drug, uh, actually they are not much different. The com combination of interventions is really not a gain for, for most clients when you see uh, the behavior over, over an extended period of time, according to, to various review, you have one reference there. In spite of this, uh, a recent epidemiological analysis done in the US showed that over 40% of clients with intellectual disability, uh, I don't have uh, data for, for ASD here, uh, are receiving one or several medications uh, not always because of their problem behavior, but psychotropic medications of different kind. kinds. They, they are usually major sedatives, but they also could be uh, benzodiazepines or antidepressants and so forth. The question that we wanted to answer here is, is the one presented in this slide. Is there an interaction between behavior function and exposure to psychotropics? And uh, we thought that this was a very relevant question to ask, given that in applied setting we are continuously dealing with clients that are uh, under several prescriptions. And uh, it would be very useful to know how that, those prescriptions might be affecting our treatments and in this particular study, our assessments of problem behavior. If you look at the behavioral literature uh, with regards to, to this question, you, uh, you will soon realize that mo most authors believe that indeed there is uh, an interaction between different types of psychotropics and behavior function. So for instance, Crossline in 2003, medications such as Risperidone could act as an establishing operation, thereby making certain events more or less reinforcing when the medication is present. 
thereby changing the function of the behavior. Similar statements are uh, indicated here for methylphenidate uh, that is commonly prescribed for problem behavior in children with hyperactivity and antidepressant uh, here. So it seems it, it kind of makes sense. It's uh, it's uh, you know medications affect the brain, and the brain of course uh, process stimuli and their value and their influence over behavior. But it has not really been checked in in depth in in the literature. So uh, we reason there, there could be two types of effects that medication could have over behavior function. Let me orient you to the graph for a second. Uh, these graphs are equivalent to the functional analysis graph that, I showed, that I've showed before. Uh, but because I'm showing two functional analysis in you know, limited space, the functional analysis without the medication and the functional analysis with the medication present, just for economy, I, I've used average uh, values. The only thing that you need to know is that the bar that sticks out usually identifies the condition that is maintaining or the condition in which the behavior is being maintained. So for instance, in this particular case, it would be attention, uh, both in the medication functional analysis and the medication-free functional analysis. Uh, whenever you see the solid uh, bars, that would be the functional analysis that was conducted when the medication was being prescribed. Okay, so there are two, uh, two general effects that we could find, or that we thought we could find. One would be that the function of the behavior remains, the behavior continues to be maintained by the same factor, but we see less of it, less of it, less behavior. There is a general reductive effect. So for instance, in this uh, real case here, uh, we see that behavior is maintained by attention in both cases, but the uh, rate, the average rate of attention across the complete assessment uh, has been uh, reduced by half. So essentially, we see that the behavior occurs less often, but the, the, the function of the behavior doesn't change. We could see another effect in which we do see a, a change in function. So here we have the medication-free uh, functional analysis and the function seems to be demand or escape, escape from task demands. Then we, or someone else, introduces the medication and we observe that uh, escape from task demand continues to produce high levels of behavior, but a new, a new function has emerged. In this case, uh, automatic or access to sensory feedback as a maintaining factor. So we thought that we should assess both types of effects and see which one might be, uh, or what might be the, the relative prevalence of, of these two types of effects. Uh, we are currently replicating this study in, in new cases, and a PhD student of mine is presenting her dissertation in, in a few weeks uh, doing a replication. But uh, what we have here is simply a reanalysis of all of the literature that have conducted, that have published side-by-side uh, -side functional analysis with and without a medication. Uh, so there are 37 published studies, and there you have the, the, the functions, automatic, escape, attention, uh, multiple, when more than one function uh, is identified in an assessment. The types of behavior, aggression, self-injurious behavior, disruptive behavior, uh, multiple behaviors, and the type of drugs involved in, in these published studies. So this is just a reanalysis, looking at all of the literature and try to put the evidence together, see if we see any, any patterns. This is the first analysis that we did. Uh, here you have participants on the x-axis, and each, each data point summarizes the, the effect, the total, the overall effect of, of uh, the medication when we compare uh, functional analysis with and without medication. So the smaller the effect size, the most reductive that the medication was. Uh, you can see that only a few cases were within the one, minus one effect size benchmark, uh, 
which is a clinically significant effect size. So interestingly, only a minority, sorry, only a minority of, of cases actually showed a very significant reductive effect. But in general, most participants show some reduction of behavior, although it might have not been clinically significant in, in many cases. We, uh, we had a serendipitous finding that uh, it would be uh, long to, to get into, but we thought it was interesting. Uh, and that's uh, what we call do uh, the dose dependence effect. It's been shown uh, in, in the animal literature that when a behavior is very high, a, me a particular medication geared at reducing that behavior uh, reduces more the behavior. And when the behavior has low frequency, the medication has a lesser effect. That's what is called a dose-dependent effect. And it, has, it hasn't been demonstrated uh, in humans, uh, and in particular, uh, in particular in this variety of problem behaviors. So when we compare the base, baseline level of the behavior, which you have here in the, in the blue dots, with the overall effect of the medication, we see that this dose-dependent uh, effect uh, occurs. These, these uh, two sections of the graphs are the same, simply that in these uh, studies the authors use responses per minute to measure the behavior, and here they use a percentage of intervals of the observation sessions in which the behavior was present. But essentially you see the same effect, so the highest the behavior during baseline, the greater the reductive effect of the medication. So that was the general, the, the general reductive effect of medication that we wanted to assess in the context of, of a functional analysis and as you saw in the previous slides was partially confirmed. More uh, interesting would be to see if the medications are actually changing the function of behavior. Uh, so le, let's go from, uh, let's go across function. So here in this slide, you have an example of a case uh, or a client that have problem behavior, in this case, disruptive behavior, maintained by automatic, maintained by sensory feedback. So uh, what we saw in this particular client is that uh, the behavior was reduced uh, significantly if you compare the average, uh, the average rates before and after the medication, this medication present, medication absent, but the, uh, the function remains. This is just an example. When we compare uh, that with all other data sets that we reviewed, we found that that was the case in every single case of behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement. So interestingly, the, when the behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement, at least based on the data set that we reanalyzed here, uh, exposure to medication, and I'm using the word medication in fairly general terms here because a number of them were used in these various assessments, did not change the function of the behavior. In the case of uh, uh, behavior maintained by attention, uh, in this particular example here, we see the same uh, sort of conclusion. We see that the behavior goes down, but the function, in this case attention, remains. And when we Compare that with all other assessments uh, that were part of this analysis. We found that in most cases, uh, in most cases, the medication did not change the function of the behavior. Uh, that was not the case uh, in uh, in these two additional data sets here. I sep separate them because these were cases of multiple control, where there were more than one function. <laughs> Going back, the Yes, so all of the data sets, uh, most of the data sets of problem behavior maintained by attention or multiply control, one of the functions being attention, did not change in function because of the uh, uh, exposure to the medication, with the exception of uh, one client here in which we see that um, a function was added, in this case, uh, tangible reinforcement. This is a function that I've not talked about, but simply means that accessing to prefer items is uh, the factor maintaining uh, the behavior. So in this particular case, only one out of how many? Eight, nine, yeah, out of nine, right? 
No, out of 10. 10, 10. yeah, one out, not one out of 10. Okay, so in, uh, in, the, skate, in the case of a skate maintain problem behavior, the results were a little uh, more interesting, but you know, this general pattern uh, was also observed. So in this particular example, again, uh, problem behavior, uh, the function of the behavior does not change due to exposure to medication. When we compare that with other data sets, we still don't see a change in function in most data sets, but in five of them, we saw that the behavior not cha did not change, but the outcome of the functional analysis was different uh, compared to the non-medication functional analysis. What happened in four of these five cases is that when the medication was introduced, the behavior stopped occurring. See, uh, and the functional analysis became undifferentiated. So uh, whatever the, the effect of the medication might have been, it suppressed the behavior to an extent that made it incompatible to run a functional analysis. And because we do need the behavior to occur for a functional analysis to be conducted. However, in one of all the cases, uh, there was an addition of uh, a function. We see here, uh, I believe I have, yeah. We see here that uh, both without medication and with medication, the behavior is maintained by escape from task demands, but we see a function being added here, automatic in this case, in only one case. Okay, so general conclusions of my presentation, and I'll close with the medication study. So, uh, patterns of behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement, there are at least five identifiable patterns. They can predict treatment effects and they could enhan and, uh, enhance uh, clinical decision making for treatment design. Much stimuli and post effects analysis, association and deprivation effects might be idiosyncratic and short lift, and high resolution post effects analysis, as the one I suggested here, can help to identify these processes and help develop interventions that are more suppressive of problem behavior. And finally, behavior function. Uh, there's a general, uh, generally there is a low frequency of uh, function changing effects due to medication, at least based on the 37 data sets analyzed in, in this study. Only uh, there was one case of function addition and another case in which uh, function became multiple when the medication was introduced. So only two potential cases of function change in 37 cases analyzed, which actually contrast with what is seemed to be the general sentiment uh, when you read the literature. Uh, and finally, uh, well, this type of analysis can help to enhance multidisciplinary work and interprofessional relationships if you know, behavior analysts become more aware of what might be the effects of medication in our work. So I would like to acknowledge all these people that have helped me to be here today and present all this work. Um, thank you. <laughs>